The story of Australia's First Peoples is the oldest continuing human story on Earth. Through countless generations of songlines, to connection with country and spirit, to resistance, struggle and survival, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander story is vast, inspiring and always evolving. This podcast series presents a collection of First Peoples' voices, sharing their experiences, achievements, hopes and beliefs. These are the real stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. Hi, I'm Mayra Sonta and you're listening to The Real Podcast Series. In this episode, I chat with the 2018 National NAIDOC Youth of the Year and Director of Indigitech, Tamina Pitt. So welcome to The Real Podcast. We have a very special guest today, Tamina Pitt. You may have heard of her because she's NAIDOC Youth winner from the NAIDOC Awards last year in 2018 for particularly her work as a girl in STEM, but also a young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leader in the community. Um, But I'd like you to introduce yourself to our listeners because I find everyone introduces themselves a little bit differently and how you see yourself and what you want the world to know about you. So tell everyone um, about who you are and where you're from and what you're all about. Hi, so my name's Tamina. I'm a Miriam woman and a Wadithi woman, um, but I was born in Sydney and always grew up here. Um, and I'm currently completing my bachelor degree studying computer engineering. How did you come to study computer engineering? Um, it was a bit of a it was a bit of a journey to get there because I actually started off studying electrical engineering. Um, but actually, even before that, I guess if we go back to high school. Um, I used to be into really sciencey and math stuff and I wasn't sure what I was going to do um, and I wasn't sure if I would do a science degree, whatever, but I was into the problem-solving aspect of engineering and design, so that's why I decided to do engineering in the first place. Got to electrical engineering, did it for two years, but it wasn't really for me, so I started doing computer engineering and that's where I'm at now. I'm almost done. And so what's that like being in what year 10, 11 and 12, you're making decisions about your future, you're an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander woman and you're into science and maths? Totally. I think I, I don't know what it was. Like I just naturally was inclined towards those subjects. Um, But actually thinking about it, when I was younger in primary school or even like really early high school, I was actually quite bad at math. And then... Um, I knew that I wanted to do better, so I got help. I got extra help and got tutoring, and then suddenly I was really good at math, and I was loving it. Um, and I'm also quite a competitive person, so <laughs> when I was doing well, it, it made motivated me to do even better. So that's when I kind of started shifting my focus towards the science and math stuff. And I never really thought about what that meant for what that meant in terms of me being a woman, being an Aboriginal woman. And Torres Strait Islander woman, like, what is that? Like, that's a bit unusual, I guess. I'd never really thought of it that way until I actually got to uni and realised that the people around me weren't like me. Um, And what is STEM? We're hearing about it in the media. STEM this, get more girls into STEM. Can you tell everyone out there what STEM, uh, the acronym means and um, why it's so important as a kind of career? So STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. So um, engineering is obviously one of those, um, any science degree. Um, but it's, I think it's important because a lot of the future careers are now going to be in STEM. A lot, of the tech, the, a lot of the innovations are happening in STEM. And there's a huge... I think the good thing about STEM is that there's a huge uh, business opportunity, career opportunity, um, and for Indigenous people to be a part of that innovation space I think is really important. Um, And you've interned at Google, um, which is super exciting. What was that like? It was really fun. It was um, such a huge international company and just being there and having to be a part and getting to be a part of that, um, this company that has, is so well renowned for their expertise as software makers, software innovators was, I learned a lot about what it was like to be an engineer and what the industry was like. 
And in terms of you talking about your problem solving and wanting to, um, you know, find ways to, um, I, I've read about your original MySpace site and you wanted to make it cooler than all your friends. So you kind of figured out a way. Like, I love people with that kind of brain who kind of unpack it and figure out how to put it back together. Cause that's not the way my brain works. Can you tell us about when you realized that you were that type of person that you wanted to be involved in that kind of design piece? Yeah. So I guess I'd, I tell, I always tell that story, but I'll tell you, tell you that yarn again. When actually the first time that I ever kind of looked at what was going on inside a computer was oh, when I was about 10 or so and my brother had forgotten the password to his laptop and this was before you this was before we had password recovery so it was just kind of you had the password or you didn't he didn't know the password and I thought we're gonna ha-, and he thought that we were gonna have to take it to the computer guy how are we gonna get the, into this computer and we were worried that mum and dad would get angry at us me as the big sister stepped in and was like, okay, we have to protect my brother. <laughs> I have to kind of Sweet. sort this out for him. And I um, went online and was trying to figure out how to hack into a computer. Um, and I just like f- was searching all in the web, figuring, figuring out exactly how to do this. Ended up getting this software onto a USB, booting my brother's laptop off a USB. All these weird numbers come up on the screen. Like where... Um, Basically, I just cracked the password for his laptop and got in. And that was the first time I ever really thought about what was going on inside of the computer. And, and um, I was curious about how that happened. How did, how did we get inside the computer? Um, and that was kind of where it started, I guess, like looking under the hood. Um, yeah, and the MySpace story, that was b- later on in when I was early high school and... Um, I don't know if many people even know about MySpace yeah, anymore. Yeah. We might need to give that a yeah. bit of a cultural reference yeah. for those younger Because I think it's, it was very, it was not, it's not around, it wasn't around for very long. I think was it was named Tom, the first guy yeah. who introduced, everyone knows Tom. And everyone, <laughs> so MySpace was like one of the early social media sites and Tom was the person that you were first friends with. And when I, it was about when I was 13 or so and everyone, all my friends had it. And you used to be able to have your own page. And the cool thing about MySpace was that you could customise your own code on your MySpace page. So me and my friends would always customise our MySpace pages and put like, put photos up or put music, whatever, like put little HTML, basically it was using HTML code to make it all fun. And that was kind of where I first was actually writing code, I guess. Yeah. So tell us about coding. What what is coding? How does it work? And what are, why do you have to code for something? Coding is it's oh, it's hard to explain because it's it's almost everything that is on the computer is converted into um, code. So I guess I study computer engineering, and that's both hardware and software. So we actually learn a bit about what happens to code once it's written and then it gets compiled, written into machine code that a computer can actually understand. How does, and then how does the hardware actually process those instructions that you've given the computer? So writing code is giving the computer instructions for what to do. Um, you write like a program and then it'll run that exact same instructions every time. Um, and that's how we write software like a lot of everything with technology is written with code. Very good description. I know a lot more about code now. Thank you very much for that. Tell us about Indigitech and what your what Indigitech is and what it's um, your role that you're playing with within that organisation. So I'm a member of Indigitech and they kind of organise the they organise meetups and events for Indigenous people that are interested in and working or studying in technology related fields and every it's probably about every couple months or a few times a year they'll have these events they're kind of um there'll be a corporate partner and we kind of listen we get to hear from an indigenous person that's in the field and they kind of talk about their perspective and also get to talk to partners and network um, if we're looking for career opportunities as well so I really enjoy that as a space where we can where I can connect with other Indigenous people that are doing the same stuff that I'm doing, that have similar interests in technology, when 
when sometimes it can feel a bit like not not many people are really thinking about or I don't know if that's the right word it's sometimes it can feel like not many people are in that space of looking at where indigenous people and technology intersect so I really enjoy that about Indigitech. And is that national and where are those kinds of events if anyone was interested in getting involved? That's at um, Sydney. They've, I think they recently did one in Melbourne as well. But they're, they're growing and expanding, so they're looking at moving to other places as well nationally. And I imagine there's some social media handles if anyone wanted to kind of follow up until an event comes to town. Would that be correct? Yeah, they've got Twitter and Facebook. It's Indigitech, I-N-D-I-G-I-T-E-K. Awesome, thank you. Um, now, role models in your life, um, you've already come across some of them kind of at school that kind of steered you in the direction of um, maths and science. Um, who else are big role models in your life and that influence you? I'm trying to think of, because I always say, I always say my mum, because she, um, she's, my mum, her name is Terry Janke, she's a lawyer and she runs her own Indigenous um, intellectual property focused law firm and also commercial law. My mum always inspired me because she has this goal of what she wants to do and make a difference in her community and she's really set out to do that and she has this... I think she's a leader in that field. She certainly is. Yeah. yeah. That's um, not just your daughter bias playing yeah. a role there. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that inspired me to look at how can I apply things that I'm... My expertise and my skills, how can I apply that in my community and look at ways of... Um, oh, what's a, how can I look at the way that technology affects Indigenous people as well and how can I find inspiration there as well? And you've done a bit of study on that. Um, so can you tell us how technology is affected or affects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or how you being um, doing work in the tech space is changing that potentially? Yeah, so I've been doing, I'm actually currently completing my thesis, honours thesis in, for my undergraduate degree. And it's only a small thesis, but I'm, it's really fun because I'm looking at ways that I can use, in, ways that, I'm looking at ways that technology can be used to incorporate Indigenous knowledge and how can, how can technology better facilitate Indigenous people and our requirements. Are there any examples that can kind of help demonstrate kind of that where those two pieces come together perhaps yeah so part of part of my research I was looking at how indigenous people use social media and there's a lot of research around saying that um, indigenous people are actually proportionally huge users of social media compared to um, non-indigenous people a lot more um, the proportion of indigenous people that use social media is more and I think that shows that we are we find ways to connect with people through social media and build relationships via social media. Um, and that has an effect of allowing us to represent our own opinions, our own perspectives, when maybe traditionally um, other forms of media don't really suit our requirements. Um, and, but yeah, so true. And it's just kind of us um, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we connect, we know who we are and we, know, and we explain where we're from and I want to know how I'm connected to you and who do you know and vice versa. So basically we're taking that cultural norm and transferring that over into social media and that's why you can see more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people yeah. um, on social media using it. But yeah, so have you come to an out... So you've done the research about it. Is there now an outcome of, therefore, social media might need to change to you know, have a, a black fella Facebook particularly yeah. or what's the outcome of your That's thesis? kind of what I'm looking at a little bit now and I think there's much more to look at in that space than what I can do in this tiny thesis but it's basically I'm looking at how can we use... Because I think the, the um, social media shows how Indigenous people actually represent ourselves through, um, through telling our own story and having our own posts, connecting with other people and changing, changing the story about how Indigenous people are represented so I think that that's how social media is good, but then there's also negative implications. Social media can feel like an unsafe space or there's racism online and um, or it also doesn't really always reflect the relationships that we have in our communities. I think that um, I've been looking at also how... Rep how, how com I've been looking at how social networks can be represented in in computers computer systems 
and how relationships are shown. And I think that there's um, complexity there with Indigenous people. It's not just are you friends with this person, it's who are they, are they who, do, who do we know, Are they? what mob do they belong to, you know? Um, what's their gender and age as well is also relevant to how you connect with other Aboriginal people. Yeah, very cool. It's, I, can, I look forward to reading it once you're finished doing kind of the research. So in terms of being online, do you think that's a conducive space to political discussions, um, political activism potentially? Totally. A lot of things that I've learned about politics and um, the scope of things in Australia, especially for Indigenous people, has been through the way that I use social media and also um, articles and information that I can find online. And so much of that is, I guess, on the online space is rich with that type of content. I can search anything and find out more information if I want to, which is so good. Um, there's... What else do I do? Uh, there's so many political activists that I can tap into on social media and just look at their, listen to what they have to say, whether it, it doesn't matter if I agree or disagree, but I guess it's that space where they have the platform to speak, to speak their mind and I can engage with them if I want to and we can have a discussion about politics or our perspective on a certain thing. And um, because it's social media, they kind of c- can tell their own story. There's not really a gatekeeper that's saying whether this story can be told or not this person just has the ability to say what they want to say yeah and that's the um that's a great thing about social media it's having that voice um and being a space to express yourself um where other other times you can't um, in terms of voice, that's a voice, tr- treaty and truth, NAIDOC theme this year as the current kind of um, youth ambassador, I suppose, for NAIDOC this year. Can you tell us um, what it was like to win a NAIDOC award and if there has been um, kind of an increase to your profile or um, how you're contributing to the broader community since becoming the youth of the year? It was really exciting to win that NAIDOC award because I think... It made me realise that my work actually had an impact on the community at large and not just the people around me. Um, And I felt really proud and happy to be able to be in that position. Um, Yeah, I guess it's inspired me to keep doing what I'm doing but also to look at how I can continue using my work and um, to empower Indigenous people and to work within my community. Um, So can you tell us um, how you see the tech space kind of changing over the next decade or so? It's changing so rapidly and you're kind of right in the thick of it. So I bet you've got a certain insight about what the next 10 years looks like. Yeah, I think technology and innovations are going to continue happening and growing and happening at a faster rate as well. So I think being being a part of that and embracing it has been really exciting um, I also think it's important that we have these conversations about what what is the role of technology on our people and how can we make sure that we're included and feeling empowered by the changes that are happening in this space. Very important. So do you have any advice for anyone um, look interested in going into the tech space? I would say look at different technology innovations that you're interested in and trying to find out as much as you can about it. Um, Finding out about who made it, how did they do it and what kind of, what did they need, what did they learn to have to get to that space? Um, And I guess if that's something you want to continue doing, you can try doing something like that yourself as well. I think, um, I think what I liked about, I think what attracted me to engineering when I was young was having that hands-on writing code when I was a kid and feeling excited by what I was able to do with just the writing of a line of code kind of thing. Um, So I think having, being able to find some space where you can learn and change and make something I think is really cool. Um, And then also just looking for who can help you out to get to that space. And just a bit about family, I don't think we've talked much about family and support, but you kind of alluded to having that support network around you and you've got a big family. Mm. Um, what role does family play in supporting you? My family helped me through so much. I think 
it actually wasn't yeah it wasn't always easy to study at uni I almost dropped out of uni when I was in second year uni when I was changing between electrical and computer engineering it was I didn't feel like I knew what I wanted to do with my future and I think tapping into that support network was what really got me through it was um not just my mum my family it was people at uni that were able to reach out and give and give me that advice that I needed and asking for help was so important to, for me to keep going and feel like I was able to continue with my studies. So that's why I think finding support networks wherever it may be is so important. And not being afraid to ask for help is a yeah. very good piece of advice. Yeah, because I think I was also really scared um, and felt isolated, so I wasn't sure what to do. And then just having somebody say, hey, like, you don't have to – if you don't want to do this type of engineering, you don't have to do it, just to change. What do you, and it was about – empowering me to make that decision for myself and then realizing that I was that was something that I wanted to do for my future and you don't have to know all the answers at 21 yeah I think I put a lot of pressure on myself too like even oh I think I do that a lot because I'm probably a bit of a perfectionist so I feel like if I make this decision this will be like what I do for the rest of my life but being only 22 years old I think I've got so much time to change and I don't, I don't know, maybe I won't be a computer engineer in the future. Who knows? And evolve and go through different, um, you know, careers and jobs and different style of workplace. It's And you're online, it's changing so rapidly. Like, I don't think any of us know what the future is going to look like. Yeah, exactly. So what does Aboriginal Australia mean to you? I think as Aboriginal Australians, we are the first Australians and we come from an ancient culture that is so rich with knowledge, um, especially coming from a, in, an engineering background. I think Indigenous people have a lot of ancient Indigenous engineering knowledge. I think Aboriginal people today are having this role where we can tell our own story about what's, what's happened in history but also determining our own future and that's really exciting. Well, thank you very much for sharing your story with us today. Super exciting. Your future and the different projects that you're involved with. And congratulations again on the NADOC Award. And we look forward to kind of continuing to follow your career and um, trailblazing through tech um, and seeing what you come up with next. Thank you. So thanks for joining The Real. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. You've been listening to The Real podcast series. The Real is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander digital media platform produced by 33 Creative. This episode was recorded in Sydney on Gadigal Country. Produced by Jake Keane and Marguerite Barbara. Music production by Jimbler. For more stories and podcasts, visit the-real.com.au forward slash podcast.